Vive is a new product that Lutron is launching uh, that we're, we're super excited about, so we'll get right into the presentation here. Um, so if you take a look at Lutron's uh, landscape of products that we offer, uh, one of our big advantages is we have everything, you know, everything from a single room where you want to do a single light, we can offer you an in-wall sensor switch or in-wall sensor dimmer, uh, all the way up to our full skill, full campus, full building, high-rise, uh, quantum solution, and that's, uh, you know, the fact that we can offer across the whole board uh, is one of the strengths of Lutron. Uh, the product we're going to be talking about today leverages on the back of what we've had out in the field for about five years called the Energy Tri-Pack. So if you're not familiar with it, it was kind of targeted at single room solutions, uh, it, and it comprised of some, some core components to meet a lot of energy codes. Um, and so a lot of the features that that Energy Tri-Pack system offered was we had local dimming, we had the ability to set a high-end trim, we had occupancy sensors so we could do ock and bake sensing, we had a daylight sensor so we could do daylight harvesting, uh, we had our Pico wall control so we could do uh, the, the ability to have personal control, we had a plug load controller and we had contact closure based system integration. Um, but the, the, that solution was uh, very great at what it offered which is control of a single room but what it didn't have was sort of a network system component to it. So it didn't offer features of scheduling, uh, load shed, uh, or backnet integration. Uh, so what, when you take a look at that solution though, what we had was basically a good product for any space that you would want to go into. So if you have a restroom where you just want to do, you know, take it from where it is today, a switch on the wall and, and add some ox sensing, we could offer you a product that uh, you take out your toggle switch, you stick in a smart RF switch, and then you stick uh, an RF sensor on the ceiling, and now that space is now occupancy vacancy, um, able to save you some energy uh, over that standard toggle switch that would just have the lights on 24-7. If you move into a private office, for example, uh, we have a solution there where we could go up into the ceiling and even in a retrofit, uh, we could put a zero to 10 volt controller in the ceiling and so you simply drape your wires across your different fixtures over to our controller and then within the space we'll put an ox sensor, a daylight sensor to do daylight harvesting uh, and a, a personal control you know, either on the desk or on the wall. And then when you look in an open office, uh, there one of the challenges is that traditional circuiting is basically we run the whole open office as one large uh, circuit and so there's not a lot of fine grain control. So if you want to get maximum energy savings, you need to kind of give a finer resolution of control, and so we offered an individual fixture controller to be able to attack that solution or that space, and that individual fixture controller then takes a, a, a massive circuit and breaks it up into a very fine grain control. So one of the ma major advantages of this solution is that it is wireless. So um, you know, we, we wire our load controller to the actual high voltage and, and the 0 to 10 volt controller to the 0 to 10 volt. But beyond that, um, the rest of the solution is wireless. And so uh, that, the fact that it's wireless means that we can install it much faster than your traditional wired system. Now, a lot of people have concerns. Um, when you talk about wireless, they think of things like, um, you know, Zigbee and, and Z-Wave and 2.4 gigahertz, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth. There's a lot of congestion, and the, the reason is those bands all overlap. They all use the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum. Um, back when Lutron was investigating wireless, we looked at the, the regulations that are out there and realized that 2.4 gigahertz, while it's good and has its advantages, um, it's great for convenient things that are conveniences, like streaming Netflix to an iPad or having a, a wireless headset. Those things are convenient. If they fail, it's not great. You're not happy, but it's not the end of the world. We said that for lighting, that's kind of not the, the approach that's going to make a lot of sense for us. We want something more robust than that, something that, uh, you know, failure is not really an option. And so we looked at the different regulations that the FCC has out there, and we found that in the 434 megahertz band, um, there's a lot of very tight regulations around that band, and so you can only transmit five seconds in an hour. There's a limit to the duty cycle, so I'm like 2.4 gigahertz where I can stream data constantly, uh, 434 megahertz is really limited in that respect, that I can only transmit five seconds out of every hour. Um, and so the, the, um, the rules and regulations make it a much quieter band, and so 
our messages are able to get through much more reliably. Uh, and that's what we branded our ClearConnect technology is our protocol that we built on top of that 434 megahertz uh, frequency spectrum. And it's why our wireless works much better than, I'll say, anybody else out there. Uh, so looking at those different space types, um, we mentioned the restroom. Also, if you have any, anywhere you have a toggle switch on the wall, uh, we have a solution that we can take out that toggle switch and put in either a switch or a dimmer into that location. Uh, and without any new wiring, you just have a, went from standard toggle switching to now smart, uh, a smart RF uh, dimmer. In the ceiling, the reason we made the ceiling controllers is if you're going into a retrofit, um, it's, it's not likely that you have zero to 10 volts in that, um, in that installation. And so if you stick your zero to 10 volt controller on the wall, you now have to fish zero to 10 volt wire down the wall. And so we said that doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, why would we do that? Let's stick the controller up in the ceiling, and then we'll just pair that wirelessly with a wall control. And um, with that, we'll make the installation of the contractor much easier. Um, we have a receptacle controller, so the way that works is basically we, again, it's a J-Box mounted um, wireless receiver. You interrupt the circuit uh, at the start of the circuit, and then it's a 20 amp controller that will switch 20 amps uh, downstream of it. And then if you want to go to the sort of the easiest retrofit in terms of, um, you know, not having to drape wire across multiple fixtures, what we can offer is it's an individual fixture controller. So now your 0 to 10 volt wire is just purely run uh, all within the fixture. So you don't have to run 0 to 10 from fixture to fixture. You just mount this controller on the side of it. And now every fixture has become a smart fixture. And so it's, it's great for um, ease of estimating jobs. If I want to go with this solution where I'm going to uh, make every fixture a smart fixture, all I have to do is walk into the room, count up the fixtures on the ceiling, and that's my bill of materials. Um, X times the, the number of controllers I need. Uh, the other neat thing that you can see with this uh, controller, it's an optional add-on, which is an, an integrated uh, combo daylight ox sensor. It's not required, but if you want to do daylight and occupancy sensing, uh, what you can do is just wire that into the controller, and then it will it has a small cone that it looks out for both daylight and occupancy. And so uh, as you walk under that fixture, the fixture comes on, and it will daylight, it'll take the natural daylight into account and uh, daylight to the appropriate level. Um, you can pair multiple fixtures. So if you have multiple fixtures that were had these sensors on them, um, when we talk about vibe, we'll be able to pair them. So if you, you know, you wanted that individual fixture sensor, but maybe you um, wanted to have multiple fixtures come on at once, we'll, we'll be able to do that as well. So now that, everything we've talked about so far was all a solution called Energy Tripack, and we've had that out in the market for about five years. Uh, what we're talking about today is rather than just being a single standalone room solution, we're going to take that solution and we're going to expand it up so now we can do entire floors and, and even entire buildings uh, on, on a relatively uh, small scale. The way we're going to do that is we're going to add in some features. So we're going to add in scheduling, we're going to add in load shed, and we're going to add in back net and sort of take all these individual rooms and integrate them together as a as a system. And that solution is what we're calling Vive. The way we're going to add all these features in is we're just going to add one component to the overall architecture of the system, which is a wireless hub. So this is the main central point for the system. Um, and so there's two versions that we have. One is a it just adds in time clock demand response and energy reporting. And then there's an optional uh, version that adds BACnet in there. Um, so whether you want BACnet or not, kind of there's two different um, hubs at two different price points. So if you look at the system architecture, the the left half of the of the diagram there, um, where all the picos and sensors and load controllers are, that all is is the, essentially the same as what we had in Energy Tripack. There, all those devices are still talking to each other. Now we just add in this hub that that's an umbrella that sits over the system and listens to what's going on and can send out a few commands to the system. For example, when you have a sweep off, it tells everybody to sweep off. Or if there's a load shed event, it tells everybody to dim down by 15 or 20%. Uh, that hub also, in addition to our ClearConnect technology, it also has a Wi-Fi radio on board. And the reason we did that is when the contractor goes out to site to start up the system, 
Um, we recognize that there's there may not be a network on site. That usually, if there is going to be a network, it's not up as you know as the building's going up. So we wanted to be able to start up the system easily and quickly. So the fastest way to do that is if the if you're able to pair your phone directly to the hub uh, over Wi-Fi, we can then commission the system. We'll get a little bit more into the details of how that commissioning works uh, later on, but, but that's the idea is that the phone can pair directly to the hub, uh, and then the hub can then translate all the messages out to our system. I mentioned that the, the system is essentially the same as Energy TriPack. There is a slight difference, though, that the Energy TriPack system, the load controllers were all receive only. They just listen to information. Uh, now, with the Vive system, we are coming out with new model numbers, new SKUs that are two-way enabled, so they'll be able to uh, both hear and, and communicate back to the hub to transmit information like energy consumption. Uh, there's also a new receptacle controller that we're coming out with, and I'll mention why we do that later. From a, a general design standpoint, the hub has a range, it's a, it's a radius that it can reach of 71 feet through construction material. Um, 71 feet is a bit of an odd number, you might ask why. If you look there, we, the, the square that you can draw inside of a 71-foot circle is exactly 100 by 100, which gives you 10,000 square feet of coverage. So the idea behind the, the hub is that for every 10,000 square feet of floor slate that you have, you, you slap down a new hub, and then we can add these up until we cover the whole system. Um, the other smaller circle you see there is uh, the range of one of the receivers. So a load controller, for example, what we're showing there is a Powpack fixture controller or one of the maestros. Each of those devices still has to be within 30 feet through construction material or 60 feet line of sight to all of the different uh, controls that are uh, talking to it. So the Pico wireless controls, the aux sensors, and the daylight sensors all still have to be within that 30 or 60 feet of the load controller, load controlling device. Um, some other system rules, the, the hub can talk to 700 devices. Uh, just some, some quick math on what that works out to. If you look at that 100 by 100 foot square, if you're doing two foot tiles, that's every other tile on, on 10,000 square feet is adds up to 700 devices. So we can get to pretty high density um, on with that 700 devices. And then each load controller, um, each maestro or um, uh, J-Box mounted controller, can talk to up to 10 occupancy sensors, 10 Pico wall controls, and one daylight sensor. To give you an idea of the models we have, so for in-wall products, I, I mentioned that these are all switches and dimmers that talk over phase control, the two wires that you have in the back box there. We have a C.L type product, which is uh, Lutron's um, patented uh, forward phase control technology for controlling CFLs and LEDs. So this is, this is going to be give you your best bet at getting a, a retrofit type LED product. Uh, that's our C.L technology. If you're dealing with uh, electronic low voltage transformers for um, some low voltage lighting, we have an ELV dimmer. And then we have two uh, switches, a 6 and an 8 amp neutral wire switch, and then a dual voltage non-neutral wire switch. If you, if you have the neutral in the back box, obviously it's better because you're going to get um, you're not going to need as high of a minimum load on that, um, and so you're, you're going to be a lot better off if you can get the neutral, but if you don't have it, we do have that non-neutral wire option. For going up in the uh, ceiling, we have both switching and dimming versions. So there is a 5 amp and a 16 amp switching version. They have the option of getting a CCO on there. The CCO, the intention of that is that it's tied to the HVAC system. So if the occupancy sensor in the room says that the room is vacant, the CCO uh, can open a closure so that the HVAC system knows uh, that it doesn't need to be cooling that room. And then there's also a, um, an 8 amp 0 to 10 volt controller. If you're familiar with our energy tri-pack line, you'll know that that's a little different from the energy tri-pack version, which was 5 amps. We've now increased that with 5 to an 8 amp controller. And it is dual voltage. Anywhere you see DV there uh, in the in the SKU or in the model number, uh, that means dual voltage. And then we have a purely contact closure interface uh, for if you're interfacing to any third party gear that needs a contact closure. Uh, I mentioned that we have a new receptacle controller. 
So this is basically the same as the 20 amp switching uh, model that you saw on the on the previous screen, except uh, sorry, the 16 amp or 5 amp. Now this one does 20 amps intended for receptacles. Um, the nice thing is with the Vive version, we're actually able to bring the price point uh, down much lower than than what it was before. And then our individual fixture controller. So if you have, if you'd like to go to the fine grain control of doing individual fixtures, we have um, both an ecosystem uh, version for controlling ecosystem drivers by Lutron, or if you're doing a zero to 10 volt driver, uh, we have a zero to 10 volt version that can control any fixture that has a zero to 10 volt driver in it. And then there at the bottom, you see the optional uh, combo ox daylight sensor, the V sensor being a vacancy only version. So that's it for load controllers. As far as the the controls, so the on-the-wall Pico, the op sensor, and the daylight sensor, those products are not changing at all. The SKUs are the same. The exact same product will work um, with Energy Tripack as with Vive. So the Pico versions we offer, we have a two-button version, both with and without raise lower, a three-button version, both with and without raise lower, and then a four-button version, uh, which we're showing here on the screen. We have a couple different ways we can do the four-button version. What's nice about it is that uh, we do have offer custom engraving on that. So the one you see on the left there, we can do a custom engraving. And this will give us in Vive a, a scene-like functionality. Um, note that the last button is always off. So uh, you have basically three scenes and off with that four-button Pico. Again, the wireless sensors are the same. So we have a ceiling-mounted uh, off sensor as well as wall and corner mount sensors. Um, and then the third one, there's a hallway sensor uh, with a long throw lens on it. And then the daylight sensor at the bottom. While we're on the topic of sensors, uh, I want to mention all of Lutron's wireless sensors in Vive are using a technology called passive infrared. And if you're not familiar with this, most people's experience with passive infrared is typically not very good. They think um, it's the sensor they have to wave their arms at. And until Lutron entered the market, that was true. All, all these sensors are based on an elbow down arm movement as the standard for what, can, what constitutes movement. Lutron looked at that and said that that's really not acceptable. We can't have this arm waving that has to happen every time uh, I want to turn my lights on or keep my lights on. And so what Lutron did is we looked at the, um, the sensor itself. And, and there's some inherent noise that happens with, with a passive infrared sensor. So if you look at the diagram there, the, the picture on the top, that's the signal that would actually come out of a passive infrared sensor. And the little bump there um, is what it, it sees when it sees motion. Uh, so we said, how can we improve this? And so what we did is we developed an algorithm to be able to filter that signal um, and get rid of the noise so that motion to us is much more easy to detect fine motion. And so the picture on the bottom is the output of passing that data through our filter you can see it's much clearer that there is motion there. And so we call that technology XCT. It stands for cross-correlation technology. Uh, that technology allows us to get um, fine motion detection. So our, our standard for what we consider motion is risk down. So turning pages on a book, or if you're working on a mouse on your computer, uh, that's what we consider to be motion and what we can detect with our XCT passive infrared sensor. So uh, when you're taking a look at different passive infrared technology, just understand that it's not all created equal. And our passive infrared sensors, we feel, are, are far superior to anything else you're going to see out there. Um, when it comes to integration, I mentioned BACnet. So the Vive hub is BACnet native. So there is an Ethernet port. I'll show you the back of the hub in a, in a, one, a slide or two. Uh, but there's an Ethernet port on the back there. And when you plug into that Ethernet port, if you have the BACnet enabled version, we simply turn on BACnet, and um, if you have a BMS system, it will be able to query our hub and pull out all the data points um, and directly be able to integrate. So there's no additional interfaces or anything required. It's all built directly into the hub. One of the nice um, use cases that I've heard is if you're dealing with HVAC, uh, coming up, we're going to need to start turning HVAC systems on and off based on occupancy of the room. I mentioned that some buildings are doing it proactively today, but more and more that's going to become required by code. And so your options are either I need to add a new sensor just for the HVAC system, and so then I have one off sensor for the lighting, one for the HVAC, or if they're tied in through BACnet, 
Lutron op sensors can pass the occupancy information through BACnet to the uh, HVAC system, and we can have uh, direct control over the HVAC and sensing uh, without any additional sensors in the room. So this is that view of the back of the hub. You can see the, the Ethernet port there. Uh, so uh, that's where we can we can wire into a building's network if there is a building network in place. Uh, and so we can sit on a, a building automation system or a BAS uh, network. Um, and then next to that, what you see is there is uh, two contact closures uh, to take contact closure inputs. Uh, the intention of CCI1 there is that it is for demand response. So if um, if you have a building that's over 10,000 square feet in California, you know that you need to have uh, the ability to load shed or demand response, uh, have a demand response capable system or demand response ready system. This system meets that with that CCI there. So if you close the closure on that, uh, just by sticking a jumper in it, the system will uh, trim by whatever you configure the load shed to be, 15 or 20%. Uh, and I'll show you where we set that up in the software when I get to my demo. And then at the bottom there, it's, it does take 24 volts to power the hub. And so there's a, an input for the, uh, the power at the bottom there. So this system was designed to be contractor friendly and easy to set up. So I'll show you the user interface. Um, but, but the whole idea behind this is that it, it is contractor friendly. Part of that is that when we set up the system, one of the things we find is that the person who installs the physical gear in the space and the person who commissions or start, starts up the system, pro, programs it, they aren't always the same person. And so when, when a person walks into a room to start it up, they need to know, traditionally, they need to know where all the gear is landed. And so oftentimes, like I said, this stuff is mounted to the ceiling. You can't see it. You have to get up on a ladder and poke around, um, you know, pop out piles and find where stuff is. So we said, how can we improve upon that process? What we, what we came up with was a, a technique for finding the load controllers that are mounted in the ceiling without actually having to go touch them. And so the way we do that is uh, when you're commissioning the system, you, will, you press a control in the space, a speaker that's mounted to the wall. It will send out a message, and the hub will then identify all of the load controllers that are within range to that Pico, and you will see a list of them, and you can flash them and identify which one is the one you're actually trying to control. So without getting up on a ladder and without poking your head through the ceiling tile, we can find and address fixtures in the ceiling um, directly from our UI and by touching just the control on the wall. Um, and so just a, a different way to look at it, here's our impression for what we think the market is going to act for and how it's going to grow over time. Um, up front, we think you know, it's a new product. People aren't super comfortable with it, so they're going to want more you know, do it for me. I bring in a Lutron tech to, to either do the startup or at least help me start um, going through the process. And then over time, we expect to do it, do it myself. Um, market will grow, and so people, as they become more comfortable with the product, uh, will will tend to do it themselves. Uh, as far as availability, we are taking orders now. The product uh, will start shipping November 1st, so we're a couple weeks away from that. Um, this initial phase, we're going to do project-based orders, so it'll be all um, you know four specific projects, and then at the beginning of next year, we're going to ship stocking orders for distribution, so you'll be able to pick those up you know, on the shelf on the fly. Um, so that's, that is the general overview. Uh, I'm going to go into my demonstration next. Before I do that, though, are there any questions? And feel free to type them into the chat window if you have any questions. Okay, uh, question there. Is this going to be available with BACnet MSTP? Uh, no, this is BACnet over TCP IP. So uh, solely BACnet over IP. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Then I'll roll into my demonstration here. Oh, one more question there. Are old compatible components compatible with the new hub? That's a great question. So um, 
old components are not compatible with the new hub if you're talking about the load controllers. So the, the Maestros and the Pow Packs, um, these types of products are not compatible with the hub uh, because they don't have that S in the model number. And so like I said, they're, they are the ones that are out there today are one way. They listen only. And these S versions uh, are two-way system capable. So the old ones do not work with the new hub. However, the Picos and aux sensors and daylight sensors, those are all uh, compatible with the new system. So any Picos and aux sensors and daylight sensors you have will work in Vive as well as Energy Tripack. Okay. So this is um, a demonstration. This is actually the room I'm sitting in right now. And so um, this is the user interface that the contractor will be greeted with. Um, this system is already somewhat set up, but basically uh, I have my rooms and areas here. I can see at a quick glance how much energy I'm consuming in the system, what, what are the scheduled events, and it'll give me a quick highlight of what's the next event, and then my state of load shed. So typically if I hadn't set up the system, I would come here to add rooms to my system, and I could add however many rooms there are. In this case, I just have this one conference room that I'm sitting in. And so if I go into that room, I can see more detailed information. So I can see obviously it's occupied. I'm sitting in this room. And I can see how much energy is being consumed. If I go in to control the lights, I can dim them down. And if I jump back here, you'll see my energy savings now is increased in that space. And I can dim them up. And now my energy savings is decreased. If I want to do some more detailed settings, I can go into devices and settings here and I can see all of the different controls that are in this space. So I have um, various Picos that are in here as well as um, my occupancy sensor. So if I wanted to change the programming, for example, on my favorite button, I could come in here to do that. I could add or remove um, devices. I can see which devices are being controlled by flashing them. And I can give a, you know, a new name to the, the Pico as well. So let's say I wanted to change the favorite programming. Right now, the default is the favorite button just goes to 50%. I can change that um, to a different level. Or I can even set per, per light or device. So if I wanted to, I could come in here. And I, if I don't know what fixture this is, I can flash the fixture. And if I wanted that fixture to instead be at 25%, because that's the where the presenter would sit, I can do that. And just set that to 25% preview what that's going to look like, and then if I'm happy, I can save that setting. I mentioned we have the ability to set high-end trim, uh, and so I can come here to do that by default. The, the default is that we set the high-end trim all the way up. We also have the ability to set low-end trim. This is particularly convenient if you're dealing with phase control LEDs. And so the reason is not every LED can dim down to the same percentage. And so if you have phase control LEDs, I'm able to come in here and change my low end uh, so that it works better for those phase control LEDs. So I'm going to turn up the lights a bit. Raise those up. And one of the other features here, so I, I can see my energy consumption. This is all real-time data. Um, so it does not have historical logging. That's one question that sometimes comes up. If you are looking for historical data, uh, the way to do that is we would have to export that data through BACnet to a BMS, and then the, the BMS system could log it. But our system will show it in real time. And so if I come to load shed here, I can deactivate load shed. And my energy consumption will increase. My savings decreases. And if I activate load shed, it's going to tell me that the lights are going to gradually dim. Uh, if you are trying to demonstrate this, most people think it's not working because 15 or 20 percent is usually pretty hard for the human eye to tell. And when you fade that over 45 seconds, it's really hard to tell. Um, but you can actually see here in my energy savings that my energy savings is increasing. Uh, and so that's how I know that I'm actually saving energy. Um, one of the other questions that sometimes comes up is how is the energy 
how's that number, where's that coming from? Uh, so if you're using an individual fixture controller, which in this case I am, I have eight fixtures in here, each one is individually controlled, those individual fixture controllers have a CT or a, a current transformer in them, so it is measuring in real time the power consumption of that actual fixture. Uh, if you're going with a circuit-based solution where you're doing a whole circuit at once, um, that solution is all calculated. So you tell us this circuit has, you know, 200 watts of load on it, and we will do the math to figure out, um, based on the percentage that the fixtures are at, how much energy those fixtures are consuming. So again, individual fixture, it's it's measured. Um, if it's circuit-based, it's calculated based on what you tell us the load is. And again, you can see that energy consumption is continuing to slowly uh, decrease as the load shed is, is activated. If I wanted to modify my load shed settings, I could come in here and change what the load shed percentage is. So by default, it's 20. By code, technically, it only has to be 15. Uh, so I could change that. I can also set per room or area. So in this case, I only have one room in my database. But if there was an executive conference room that we didn't want to load shed at all, I could remove it from the load shed settings, and that room would be unaffected. OK, I have one question come in there. Is there a list available of backnet points that will be made available? For example, uh, some of the Notion integrators we have perform to wireless switches do not provide status for use by the BAS. So yes, uh, there is, we have a backnet PIX statement, it's called. Um, that is available. So if you, I can pull it up here actually, .com. And if you go to our products and you select Vive, Uh, there's a link here for different documents that we have, and it's under our um, all products and then specification submittals. There is what's called a PICS statement, P-I-C-S or P-I-C. Um, and so that PIC statement will list out our compatibility with BACnet. There's a bunch of BACnet information there. But then down below here uh, is a list of all the different points that we enable. And so uh, you can see, you know, lighting level, lighting state. These are, that would be, lighting level would be your, your level for the actual lights at the moment um, for any uh, specific BACnet point. Every um, system that gets started up is going to be slightly unique. And so the, the actual IDs are going to be different. So this is the generic information. And then to get the specific information about the system you're working with, uh, there is a way to go into the hub and get that information out. So if I, I can go into the hub and see the BACnet IDs or edit the BACnet IDs for the different rooms. And then I can also get an ID report here that you'll see. So this is the report ID for, for that room. So that's the idea of that room. And then within that room, um, there's all the different loads. So that's one way to pull out the information. And then the other way through, for BACnet is um, if you do a who is command with your BACnet system, uh, you can uh, query the system for all the different BACnet points that are out there, and we will respond to those. And again, that will all be information as per our PICS statement. All right. And then for schedules, um, you can come into the, the screen and uh, see what events are scheduled. Uh, I can click on a particular event and see what's going to happen on that uh, day or at that time. I can test the event. I can change the programming here. 
So this is an all off. So we're going to sweep off at 6.04 p.m. And that's a fixed time event. I can also change it to an astronomic time event. If I wanted to add a new event, I simply click the plus sign up here in the upper right hand corner. And I can name it. So this is my good morning. Specify what days that's going to happen on. I can make it a at sunrise event. And take the lights to 15%. And it's as simple as that to create a new, a new time clock schedule. I can test it if I'd like. Now you can see here at 6.45, that's sunrise. So it, is, it does have an astronomic clock, so it's based on uh, my geographic location. This is when sunrise is. And so it's going to have that potentially at a slightly different time every day. Here's 6.55 than this day. 6.56 is getting shorter. Uh, there are some more advanced features we can get into with um, the uh, the system in terms of Wi-Fi and and how the system is accessed. This particular system um, has both a wired connection to it and a wireless connection. So there is a password that if you're using the wireless on the hub, by default out of the box, the hub is not password protected, not encrypted. So the very first thing when you connect to it, the only thing you can do with the system is you must encrypt the Wi-Fi. We don't allow you to do anything else until the Wi-Fi is encrypted. And so this has already has the uh, Wi-Fi encrypted, but you can change the password there. Uh, you can also disable the Wi-Fi. So if there's um, if there is a desire to, to not have the Wi-Fi enabled, I can come in here and I can disable the Wi-Fi um, if you want to use the building Wi-Fi because the IT department, uh, that's their preference. Okay. Um, that's it for the demonstration. Uh, if you guys would like, uh, we can come out to your site and give you a demonstration in person, show you how this is actually commissioned. I know it's, it's, it's hard for me to show you how the actual commissioning happens here. But if you'd like, um, Wes can come out and give you an in-person demonstration of the software. You guys can, we have actual hardware we can bring around and you guys can try it out for yourselves and see how it actually works. Um, or the conference room I'm sitting in here is, is uh, just by John Wayne Airport. That's another option is if you want to stop by here, we can certainly set up some time and show you how the system works in a real installation. Um, I'll, I'll leave it open for any more questions, but if not, that's, that's the end of my presentation. So thank you guys for attending. I really appreciate the, uh, the time. And again, just feel free to reach out. Um, for pricing, uh, we'll have to, right now we're doing all job-based business, so we'll have to get some specifics on jobs. Um, Generally, I can tell you it is definitely very price competitive against any of the solutions out there. So if you're familiar with what energy tripack costs, the load controllers are a little more expensive. Um, but you're looking at maybe $10 per load controller-ish more expensive. Um, the hub, you're looking at, let get off the top of my head. I mean, generally, you're looking at budget around two grand per hub, I think. And then you'd be safe. I think that's a little conservative, well, not necessarily the high five, but just if you budget around there, um, that's what you're looking at. I think we're generally the, the square footage pricing I'm hearing is in the 75 cents to a dollar per square foot product cost is, is roughly um, what I've been hearing. And again, I think that's that'll vary a little bit on job by job depending on the density of controls, but. Um, that's, that's what I've been hearing. Okay. Any other questions? I'll give another minute in case anybody's 
still typing, and then uh, I'll I'll end the webinar. Okay, not hearing anything else. Uh, thank you guys. Thanks again for attending, and uh, you guys have a good day.